today's date is 24 March 2023. I'm here at the Tank Farm. I have the pleasure of sitting down with Gordon Sumner. Good Thank morning. you, sir. Appreciate you sitting down and talking to us today. Um, if you could just give us just a little bit of background on yourself. Where were you born, grow up, where did you go to school, that kind of stuff. Well, uh, as I tell people, I was born at a very early age, right next to my mom. Uh, I was actually born in America's Georgia. And people may not recognize it, but if you know the history of our president, Jimmy Carter, that's where he's from. Okay. They're in Plains, America's area. And the only reason I was born in America's Georgia was because my dad was in the middle of a transfer and mom was having a delayed pregnancy. And so he finally said, well, why don't you go home to your parents and have the baby and let me know how it turns out. So she went home to be with her folks, my grandparents, and that's why I was born there. And as soon as I was able to travel, then off we went. So, so I've lived uh, primarily in the South, different locations, and grew up all over. People ask me, where am I from? And I just finally picked Alabama because that's where I finished high school, went to college, joined the Army. Gotcha. It just made it really simple instead of trying to do all over stuff. So. Okay. so your father was, was military? <clears throat> he was for a while. Uh, then he got out and served with what is now known as Colonial Pipeline. Okay. And he was in the Army? He was in the Navy. Navy, okay, Navy. Uh, any other family members that were military? Oh yeah, my Sumner family dates all the way back to the Revolutionary War. So since uh, the Revolution, I've had a direct descendant that has been in every major conflict out of our country. And I've also had a direct descendant in uniform consistently since 1940. To include my daughter who is right now serving as a major physician assistant in the Air Force. It's a lot of family history. Did that uh, impact your decision to join the military at all? That and a low draft number. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. You know, that works every time. Right. So, um, but yes, I mean, we grew up around the military. Uh, I can remember as a young kid growing up and one of my favorite uncles was a World War II and Korean veteran and Marine uh, aviator. He was Uncle Edmund. He was one of the original Marine Corps Silver Eagles from World War II that dates back to the Pacific days where they, had uh, run out of some of the commission pilots, so they got some of the enlisted guys that were working on the aircraft, primarily the Corsairs, and said, hey, you know how to fly this thing? Here's a mission, go, go bomb something. And so he became one of those guys. Okay. Uh, flew with Pappy Boyington, and I just, I just remember Uncle Edmund coming in and how sharp he looked in his uniform and how professional he was. And I can remember even when I was in the Boy Scouts, and I would put my Boy Scout or Cub Scout uniform on, and I would look in the mirror thinking, I wonder if I'd look like what Uncle Edmund would expect me to look like. So, right. yeah, it was, it was a good role model. Yeah. When did you enter service? Uh, 1970, 71. Okay. <clears throat> Were you drafted or did you volunteer? I went ahead and signed up to the Army Reserve. Okay. Uh, we had a really nice Army Reserve unit that supported our university's uh, ROTC department. Gotcha. So it was just an easy way to go down. Uh, in fact, it was funny, the next morning after they did all that, um, six of us showed up in the ROTC building and the colonel commander was standing there with paperwork all ready to go for us to sign on the dotted line. So we, back in those days, they had what they called the simultaneous members program. So you became an enlisted reservist, but you were recognized as what they called a third lieutenant. So you would kind of do duties as like a junior officer, a boy scout in the reserve unit. And back in those days, the reserves were not like, like we do today. I mean, it really was a weekend deal, barbecues, clean the trucks, that kind of stuff. So it really wasn't, wasn't anything. And then uh, right before I was commissioned, uh, you're discharged. So I was, I fluctuated, but I finally got out as a PFC and um, on one day and then 48 hours later, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. Uh, why the Army? Well, that was the only choice I had, honestly. Um, didn't, I didn't, the Marine was not interesting, no intent in the Navy, just the thought of something being blown out from underneath me and me swimming, that was not gonna work. And the Air Force um, would have seriously considered it, but the Army uh, just sounded like something I could, I could get into, try it, and then again, get out. Because I, I was gonna be a piano major. So I had no intent of making the military my career at all. It was just do my time for God and country, make the family proud, right. and then that was it. So as it turned out, uh, I got into the infantry, loved 
being in the infantry. I had great assignments at Fort Stewart, Georgia with the 2nd Battalion, 34th Infantry Regiment, and then I was in the 1st Battalion Rangers at, at Stewart with Colonel Joe Stringham, now retired General Joe Stringham, uh, who I'd followed to hell and back. Just a great example of leadership, Army officer, the whole thing. And so I thought, um, you know, this was fun. But then after a while, I realized one day while we were on an exercise, it was actually the uh, readiness exercise, what we call the RTEP. And I looked at Colonel Stringham at the time, and, and I thought, he's about 45 years old, um, been through combat himself by then, and he looked like he was about 80. And I thought, wait a minute, the old man is carrying the same rucksack, carrying the same rifle, eating the same frozen sea rations I'm eating. The only difference is he's getting paid more. And I thought, do I really want to look like that 20 years from now? And the answer was no. As much as I was loving life, I had this reality check. Yeah. So in 78, I was resigning my commission. War was over. I had done, as I mentioned, what I felt was my time for God and country and made the family proud. And um, as I tell people, I'm the poster child for God works in strange and mysterious ways. Because if you look at my military career, things happen through those 20 plus years that there's absolutely no way it would have happened any other way. As I understand um, opportunities and I understand coincidence and all that stuff, but not 10 of them in an Army career or something like that. So it just so happened that I turned my paperwork in and my assignment officer, a guy named Roger Duckworth, got promoted as uh, their what was called Milperson, Military Personnel Center. And he came in that weekend to clean his desk off and he saw my file sitting on his desk. And he calls me at 6.30 in the morning on a Saturday, Fort Stewart, Georgia. I'm up early, even if it's on a weekend. I answer the phone, Lieutenant Sumner, and I hear this, what the hell are you doing, Lieutenant? And I you know, blew the phone out of my ear, and I said, hello? And he says, what the hell are you doing? I said, Captain Duckworth? He said, Major Duckworth, to you? And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Why are you calling me at 6.30 on a Saturday? I'm in here saving your career. And I said, what? He said, well, I see you, you put in your paperwork to resign your commission. I said, yeah, I'm going to, to grad school. I've applied down to Florida State uh, to go down there. And uh, he says, well, I'm in here going to save your career because you want to go to flight school. And I said, well, yeah, I'd like to, but we kicked all the pilots out. And he said, yeah, I screwed that up, kicked out too many. So if you want to go to flight school, your class starts in 30 days. So I'm like, okay, that sounds good. So um, he took my papers, literally threw them, he said he threw them in the trash can right there, ripped them in half, threw them in the trash can. He says, all right, now I'm cutting your orders, so don't screw this up, because you got to go get all your exams done, you got to pass your physical, you got to do all that stuff because you're going to Fort Rucker. And if you don't do that, you're gonna end up at Fort Rucker just as a staff guy, because you won't be able to go to flight school. So don't screw it up. So again, here's another one of those quirks of fate. The guy who happened to have been our battalion executive officer was an army aviator. His name was Dean Anderson. And he had just left the infantry to take command of his aviation company there in the 24th, Alpha Company of the 24th Aviation Battalion over at Hunter. He also, he and his wife Linda, were classmates in high school of my sister. So I'd known them when I was a kid. And now here he is in the Army, now a major. So I walked down to his house there on, on post, knocked on the door, told him what, I'd, what had just happened. So he told me, he says, got this, you be in my office Monday morning, I'll take care of everything. So when I got over there, he had all my exams lined up, he had my physical lined up at the hospital. And he says, and I'll see you tonight. You're going to spend the night with us. I'll tell Colonel Stringham, you know, he'll see you tomorrow. I'll tell your company commander. He says, we'll just take care of you. So I passed, passed everything. And literally, literally 30 days to the date of that phone call of uh, Roger Duckworth, I was taking what we call the nickel ride, your first time in the old T-55 training helicopter at Fort Rucker. And I became an Army aviator and flew for another 20, 22 years. Let's go back to when you decided you were going to join the military, 1970. <coughs> a lot of turmoil in this country. Vietnam War is going not very popular. No. <clears throat> Was there any um, hesitancy on your part to, to enlist, knowing that, okay, I might end up in Vietnam? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, all you had to do was turn on the news. Um, and again, you, 
there was that part of the patriotic piece of my family and me. There's a part of the unknown that's there. And if anybody tells you that they didn't think about it, they got more problems than, than just that. But yeah, there was a lot of thought. I mean, why not? I mean, you're an 18 year old kid. You still got your life in front of you. And I mean, I didn't know what was gonna happen on, on the college campus. You know, I didn't know if I was gonna pass my exams. I didn't know if I was gonna make the baseball team. You know, those kinds of things. So when you, when you sort all that out, then you have to be true to yourself. And that's, that's what I felt was, at that time, the right thing to do. And I don't regret it. Yeah, yeah. So did you ever make it into Vietnam? Uh, I ended up going back in a unit, like I said, in 75. Okay. Right, right before, right, right around the time Saigon fell. Okay, and you were World War so I, But I wasn't in any particular hard combat at the time. You were you were part of the Vietnam War. What, what was yeah. your your infantry back then? I was infantry. Okay. What were your initial impressions when you got there? Hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot. Right. Hot, noisy, a little chaotic. Um, again, had to, good leadership was going on. Right. Um, you know, I had strong NCOs at the time. All you had to do was listen to them. They'll tell you what to do. They'll tell you what not to do. Any uh, any incidents, good or bad, that stand out about your time in Vietnam? No, not really. No. Just it was so it was one of these in and outs uh, that we're just able now to start talking about a little bit. Not everything, but right. the fact that yeah, we can now say we were there. How long were you there? Just uh, probably maybe two months, okay. two three months. And you're, you're attached to an infantry unit, but I'm assuming that's not what you did. Right. So you, you come back, you, you decide you're going to get out, you get to flight school. Uh, tell us a little bit about flight school. How long is that? It's a year. What's involved? It's a year. Um, okay. You really learn a lot about yourself. Um, when you go from flying helicopters, uh, you know, it was kind of funny. I tell people, they say, well, what, what was the driving factor? I said, well, I got tired of walking. <laughs> you know, So now I could go fly places. But right. The excitement of just being up there and flying, it's, it's hard to describe it unless you've done it yourself. Uh, same thing with being a paratrooper. Unless you do that, unless you jump out of perfectly good flying airplanes and experience that rush, uh, you can't describe it. You have to do it. So being an Army aviator was just a dream come true. As I said, my family, my dad was an aviator, my uncle's aviators. Um, that's all I remember them doing. I thought, I'd like to do that one day. But at the time, it just wasn't there because we didn't need them, didn't need aviators. And then, like I said, Captain, well, Major Duckworth calls me up and says, hey, we, we need more pilots. And if you want to go, the door's open. Just go. So I did. I, I jumped through that door, like, that quick. Right. Uh, any major <coughs> challenges that you faced? While uh, flying? While, no, no, during flight school. Oh, <laughs> well, um, believe it or not, uh, and I still don't know how I did it, but somehow I managed to almost turn the training helicopter upside down while we were doing some maneuvers. Um, I didn't, I think what happened is I didn't have my seat belt really tight. I had it on, but it wasn't like snug. And we were practicing auto rotation. That's where the instructor pilot rolls the throttle off, and simulates an engine failure, and then you glide the helicopter down and then you, and you land it without any power, which a hel that's what helicopters do. Except I wasn't, I wasn't doing it fast enough to Jack. Jack Lowy was his name, um, Vietnam pilot extraordinaire. And so when he would announce the uh, simulated engine failure and roll the throttle off, I was a little slow in reacting to get the collective down, keep the rotors spinning at the appropriate RPM and all that kind of stuff. So finally he got frustrated. He says, look, you know, you got to do this. You got to. So I was like, all right, all right, all right, I got it. So the next time I kind of glanced over and I saw him reach like this to, to roll the throttle. And as, as I kind of glanced like that, I just jammed it down trying to get, you know, a little smart butt and just threw it down like that. Well, when I did, the helicopter kind of did a slump, which caused me to come up. And when I came up out of my seat a little bit, that I, the aircraft, because of the nature of the aircraft itself, it'll yaw. Well, when it yawed like that, I went this way and my left foot hit the pedal. And when it did that, it just went right on over like that. And I was grabbing the, 
the cyclic to pull it back up to get the nose up, <clears throat> Jack was fighting me because what I didn't realize is that by doing that, here's the aircraft, here's the rotor system. The tail's coming up, the rotor's going down. Could have easily had a catastrophic tail boom failure. So he was keeping me from pulling the nose straight up that quickly. But, but we were able to you know, pull it out as we were falling like that. Right. And I remember my, my heart was literally, the only thing keeping my heart in my chest was the seat belt, I think, the straps. But uh, it didn't phase him at all. At least it didn't seem like it. Right. We got right back up to practice altitude. Next thing I know, simulated engine failure, go. And he made me do it again, just like getting back on a horse after getting thrown. And we did two or three more of those, and we went back to the airfield. I got out, and he says, all right, that was good. That was good. I think we learned something today. And then the next dude that got in, I unbuckled and undid my helmet, and I'm walking back. And I remember getting a cup of coffee, and I was shaking so bad that I couldn't pour coffee in, in, my, in my styrofoam cup because right. I was just, I, it, it hit me. And I was doing this number like that. Just another day for him, though. But just another day. <laughs> just another day for Jack. Yeah. And we still remain close friends really? even to this day. So they live out, he and Susie live out in Fort um, Worth, Texas. And Has he ever mentioned that incident since? We, we have laughed about it a few times, um, but I don't think I'm the only student that tried to, right. sure. to do stuff over his long career of aviation yeah. instructor piloting. Wow. What, what did you end up flying? When I graduated from the Army, um, I was fortunate enough to have flown in every make and model of aviation that we had at the time, except for the Chinook. That was the only that was the only aircraft. I flew all the Scouts, Attack, Lift, everything from Hueys to Blackhawks, Cobras, all models of Cobras, uh, Scout aircraft. Uh, always laugh and tell people the reason I didn't fly the Chinook was because I didn't want to fly anything that could have a midair with itself. So <laughs> I, I skipped the Chinook, but um, never had that opportunity to to fly it. I also flew, um, had the opportunity as an exchange officer to fly with the British Army Air Corps, so I was qualified in the British Lynx and the French Gazelle, because that's what we had in the squadron that I flew, the scout gun teams. Okay. So I, I flew those aircraft as well. Okay. Any, any one of those aircraft <coughs> stand out as your favorite? Cobra. I mean, for the American side, Cobras. Yeah. I mean, I had a few hours, you know, a little few. Uh, as I was getting out of aviation at the time, um, the Army was saying I was getting too high in rank and having too much fun, so no more flying for you. Uh, here's your, what we call the mahogany bomber. So, you know, I'm stuck behind staff assignments and desks. But I did get a chance to fly some in the Apache, uh, the Alpha model, uh, before we converted over to the Longbow. So I did get a chance to fly some of that a few bit. But the Cobra, and going through all the transitions from the, from the basic G model Cobra that I used to over torque a lot, <laughs> much to the chagrins of my maintenance warrants, uh, especially if we were doing night flying and uh, gunnery, you know, air gunner, because the way, the, the way you do flares <clears throat> in a Cobra in the G model is you would actually bring it up to about a 15 foot hover and then you would rock the aircraft like this. You'd go back and forth until you watched your attitude indicator and when it got to 15 degrees, nose up, you'd close your eyes and you'd hit the flare button. And it would shoot off the, the flares. And the front seat, who already had his eyes closed, then would open it and you would transfer controls of the aircraft. And then the front seat would take it and, and get the aircraft back stable again. Because you, if you had your eyes open when the flares went out, you'd lose your night vision, just like sticking a flashlight. So that's how we used to do it. And sometimes just by accident, I'd, I'd be doing this number and I'd pull it up like that. And I could see the over torque gauge over here on the side, just do the little red light and come on. So I, like I said, flying that and then watching all the transitions from the G model into the ECAS, F model, S model, right on through, seeing the tow systems come in and how we work those, going from a, a 7.62 Gatlin gun to the 20 millimeter gun. That's what I had on my Cobras in Grenada. It was a 20 millimeter. I mean, you could put your initials in something, you know, a mile away. 
So yeah, Cobra was fun. British side, uh, the Lynx. Absolutely fantastic aircraft to fly. I had an opportunity before I left uh, to go from the Mark I to the Mark VII. And I tell people that's like going from a Huey to a Blackhawk. Just the whole difference in how it was built, the drivetrain, the powertrain, the engine, how it upgraded the engine, more lift, more power, more stability. It actually had uh, automatic pilot on it, so I could set it, take my hands off an aircraft the, for a helicopter, you know. And I could also do barrel rolls in it okay. because it had a rigid rotor system, so you could actually roll the wow. roll it like that if you wanted to, which I did. I'm sure you did <laughs> intentionally this time. Yes. <laughs> yes, intentionally. You mentioned it. You mentioned it. So let's talk about Grenada. Uh, Grenada was, uh, again, one of those that didn't know it was going to happen. Um, I had just reported in to the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, by now, I'm a pretty senior captain. Okay. Uh, I, by, the, by that time frame, what the Army was doing was they were taking officers, putting them through the officer basic course, giving them an assignment somewhere so they would go out and spend three years, four years or so, then they'd bring them back to what we call the captain's course, captain's command course, the advanced course. So around that four year mark, that's when these kids are coming through to do that kind of stuff. Well, as an aviator, <coughs> before you could be even chosen for aviation back then, because it wasn't a branch, it was an alternate specialty. So you had to serve in one of the four combat arms to be considered. So you had to be an infantryman, air defense, artillery, or armor officer and you had to serve as a platoon leader for three years. And then you could put your application in to go to flight school. Okay. Um, so you take a whole year of basic stuff, add another three to four years of TO and E time at a unit somewhere as a basic branch combat arms guy. Then you get picked up for flight school. Then you go through a whole year of flight school. Then you go to another three year assignment three or four year assignment as an aviator somewhere, a couple of those, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there, I got nine years, nine or 10 years in the military. And I get a phone call saying, you haven't been to the advanced course yet. So I said, well, yeah, I know. <laughs> and they said, well, where would you like to go? So I ended up doing that. And I came out of the advanced course assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. And when I got there, um, again, just so happened that I met the guy who at the time was the um, logistics officer, the, the S-4, for the 1st Squadron 17th Air Cavalry there. And he said, oh, if you're coming to Bragg, this is a great outfit. You're going to love it. We do all of our support base right from Simmons Army Airfield. We very rarely go to the field. Uh, a lot of flight time even for the commission guys like us. Colonel B Billy Miller, great guy to serve under. You need to come here. So I contacted the colonel and told him who I was. And, and Stan, had, Stan Cash was the, the captain. He took a copy of my files with him and gave it to the adjutant and to the colonel. So they were kind of expectant. So they told me, when you get here, don't go to in processing. Come straight to the CAV headquarters and we'll get you started there, which I did. So it made it real easy. They already had it lined up. I just came in, went straight through in processing, through Corps, 18th Airborne Corps, 82nd Airborne Division, G1, and back right back that afternoon to the CAV headquarters. So um, they said, all right, so you're going to be assigned to B Troop. We all needed uh, you know, leadership down there, so congratulations. And it was perfect timing because the next week we left for two and a half weeks of gunnery, both individual as well as, well as aerial gunnery for the whole CAV Troop. Now, Bear in mind that back in those days, this was what we called the H model Air Cav Squadron. It was a self-sufficient Air Cavalry troop. So I had somewhere around 450, 475 paratroopers assigned, a lot more than what a Lieutenant Colonel in Aviation commands today. I had my own prop and rotor shop. I had my own medical platoon. I had a 44-man infantry platoon assigned to me with an infantry lieutenant and an NCO in charge. My own cooks, um, my own POL, petroleum oil and lubricant, so gas myself if I needed to. I could fix the helicopters. I could do gunnery. I, I could go and not have to worry about it. It's like being a nuclear 
submarine. I just go out myself, and then when I'm ready to come home, I come home. So uh, we were a big part of the division's uh, war plan. So it just so happened we were about to come up on what's called mission cycle. That's the group that's designated within the division that when the phone rings, you've got two hours to assemble, and within 18 hours, you're deployed somewhere. So we were just about to come up on that cycle when I reported in. So we did two and a half weeks of AP Hill gunnery, AP Hill, Virginia. So we came back, and within the next few days after that, that's when Grenada started. So we were about as proficient as a unit could ever be. We were right at the top of our game when we deployed. Um, and so we ended up going to um, Barbados, and that's, it took five, four or five C5A galaxies to get the whole thing down there with all the helicopters and equipment, not to mention my soldiers. And so we got down, put all the helicopters together, and uh, got briefed, and then we just waited until they said, this is it. And then uh, we got the orders, and we flew out early that morning. Our objective was Pearl's Airfield, which was on the east side of the island, where Point Salinas was down in the bottom where the Rangers jumped in. While all that was going on, we were coming in from Barbados from the east in, in a, and uh, capturing Pearl's Airfield in that surrounding area right there that morning. Um, how much time <coughs> between the time you, you, you found out, okay, we're going, to you're actually in Grenada? How much time has elapsed? How quickly was that? Uh, it was literally overnight. Just overnight, okay. Yeah, in fact, when, uh, when I took over the squadron, I had contacted my operations officer, John Bendick, and I, uh, I said, when's the last time we've had any kind of telephonic alert or whatever? And he said, well, the last time we were on mission cycle, which was two months ago. And I said, all right, so tell you what, I'll start it, and I'll give you the message, and we'll just do a telephonic thing, and we'll see how it works out. So the idea was, um, because we were in OD uh, shirts, T-shirts, and we always got together for PT that morning, I said, so I'm going to change it and I'll have everybody in white t-shirts. So then I could see who got the message and who didn't. So I called John up at whatever time it was that evening, and I said, okay, telephonic alert, mission is white t-shirts, PT in the morning, see you, go, click. Now within two hours, everybody in squadron down to the brand new PFC has to be alerted and report back that we're all up. So literally within maybe an hour, uh, Captain Bendix calls me back and says, hey boss, um, we're on alert, M plus two room briefing in one hour, ready to go. And I said, John, that wasn't the message I gave. And he says, that's the message I just got. We're on alert. I'll see you at the division headquarters, sir. Click. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I guess we're going somewhere. Right. So I met him there at what we call the M plus two room, which is in being the time the phone plus two hours. So M plus two, we, we're there getting the briefing from the general, and he turns it over to the intelligence officer, the G2, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas, and he pulls this map down, and he says, gentlemen, the island of Grenada, and I'm going like, Grenada, don't remember Grenada and the Mediterranean, because remember, this is right when the Beirut bombing happened with the Marines, so I'm thinking we're going over there to help you know, our Marine buddies out, and then as he starts talking about it then it, the light starts to come on. Because as you go into mission cycle, the intel folks come down and they give you a semi-classified update of what's called the hotspot brief. So here's things that's going on around the world that the government's got their eyes on that might affect the 82nd Airborne Division and mission cycle commands. And I remember them talking about Grenada, how um, the, the bishop had been he and some of his folks had been taken out and was murdered. Uh, this guy named Cord and Chicken Man had taken over the country, Marxist ruling and all that kind of stuff. So then things started coming together. So by that afternoon, uh, I knew it was for real because the uh, trucks started coming from the ammunition supply point and they were literally offloading bullets and magazines and everything we needed for the helicopters to start getting those palletized to put on the aircraft. And when I saw that, I thought, yeah, we, we just, we're, we're looking at now having a two-way live fire exercise.
So what I did was I got all my guys together and I had all my platoons, like little companies. And I took all my Vietnam veterans, mainly my warrant officers, and I said, I want you to talk to these guys. I don't want any John Waynes, okay? This is, this is for real. This is not going to APU Hill, okay? I want you to talk to them. I want you to tell them what we might expect from your, your viewpoints. I don't want any war stories, but I want them to have an understanding about what is maybe just about to happen. So I want all you warrant officers going out there and all you senior non-commissioned officers, I want you to tell these guys, especially these junior warrants out there with all of 200 hours under their belt, what they, what they need to be thinking about. Because we're all going to come back. So, what is your mission in Grand Ave? What is your responsibility? Our, our mission was to capture and secure Pearl's airfield, uh, cut off the supply line, uh, cut off any uh, retreat routes from the elements that were down in Salinas that might be going north, which they did. And our area went all the way from the coastline up to the top of Mount Catherine, which is the high point in the middle of the island. It's about 3,500 feet elevation up there. <clears throat> and so we had that secured area. And then we transitioned from, we were in support of 2nd Brigade. So then we had sub-elements into which battalion. So we went from 3rd Battalion over to 2nd Battalion with George Crocker and then was his direct gun support for a couple of the operations that we went through. Okay. So you're, you're, you are providing air support yeah, we're or providing. The yeah, we're providing the Cobra support okay. with the scout gun team. So we're out sniffing the bad guys, okay. um, kind of tell them where they are. Um, got one call. There was a couple of armored vehicles that they they found um, uh, PRCs that were rolling around. So we took those out with a couple of tow missiles. Um, we did an interesting operation on the top of uh, Mount St. Catharines. So they kept, they, the division within there, they kept getting these aerial intercepts. They could hear radio traffic, and it was always in the evening. Um, and so the Cubans who were on the island, and some of the People's Republic of Grenada folks, People's Republican Army, the PRAs, they were sending radio messages. It was basically, hey, we need to get out of here, somebody come rescue us kind of deal. But we never could find them. <clears throat> and so one day, I just happened to be up with some of my guys, and we're flying around, and one of my guys looks over and says, something just doesn't look right. And we got to looking at it, and what we discovered was there was a lot of, there was some bamboo up on top of this mountain. And there was no bamboo anywhere else in that area. They said that one little spot with a few stalks of bamboo. So I thought, huh. So we called back up to the operations, put a couple of the squads of my ARP guys on standby, had them hop on a couple Blackhawks, flew them up to where we were doing this high orbit circle, brought the Blackhawks in, put the infantry on the ground, and discovered that within the bamboo they had antennas. So what they were doing is they, we found the coax coming out the, the bottom running underground into an old shed back here that you couldn't see. And the guys would come in at night, plug in the radios, power of the generator, run the antenna up through the bamboo, sticking it up like this, get on the radio, and then they'd run it back down, disconnect, cover it all up, and then go back through the jungle and hide again. So we destroyed all that. How, how long were you in Grenada? Uh, three months. Okay. Yeah, three months. How Came back right, at, right around Christmas, okay. right, right after Christmas. What kind of resistance did you guys Resistance. Resistance. Was, was it, you know, how, how, how formidable was the, the opposition? At the very beginning, it was, uh, it was interesting. I mean, we had, um, we had some ground attacks. Um, the night I was wounded, um, we got hit by a substantial size force that hit my perimeter. Um, we were set up kind of like Vietnam. You know, I mean, the pictures you see of where we were set up kind of in this jungle environment, it looked just like a fire base. We had it modeled right at, right at it. Fortunate for us and unfortunate for them, they hit right at one of our strongest points. That's where I had the bulk of the heavy guns because it was most likely avenues of approach. So we had it set up just textbook 
right out of basic 101 infantry tactics, set up your perimeter. And, um, and so that, that was it. We had our biggest aerial firefight was right before Thanksgiving uh, at a place called Woodlawn Estates. Okay. And we kind of thought everything had died off. Um, and then all of a sudden the radios just went crazy. And what I believe it was is that enough of the bad guys had to finally decided that they, they were going to make a run for it. <clears throat> Come hell or high water, they were, they were running. And they ran right into one of the infantry units from 2nd Brigade. And that started this firefight. And then it just started expanding from there as, as more forces started showing up. And so we got the phone call to get the Cobras over there. And so we, when we got there, I mean, it was just, you could just see it was like kicking an anthill. Guys running all over the place down there. So. Can you tell us about being wounded? Yeah, it was kind of one of those where um, it was on the 2nd of November and my uh, senior NCO, Paul Lacey, he and I had kind of laid down for the evening and checked all the trap lines and everything. Right. Um, Sometime during the night, uh, all hell broke loose. You know, you could hear the guns going off. You could hear the yells of the guys up on the line. And so, you know, we always slept with one boot on kind of deal. So Paul and I, you know, were up, headed to the sound of the guns. And uh, you could see, you know, red tracers going that way and green tracers coming this way. And I mean, it was, and then all of a sudden I just, I got knocked down and I thought I tripped. But I just, all of a sudden I just, boom, like that. And at first, when I was telling the story, I thought, well, this is just weird. This is just me. But now, over the years, that I've shared the story or I've listened to other uh, guys and gals' stories, especially some of the younger ones that I visited at Walter Reed with my Purple Heart chapter, and hear them tell their stories and what they experienced when they were wounded. It's amazing how many people have the same thing, and that is the whole world slows down. Things were happening, but it was at slow speed. It's like taking a record and playing it on slow speed, that same noise, that rural, rural sound that you get. I could see people moving, I could see arms doing this, but it wasn't at real speed. The sound wasn't at real speed. And Dennis, honestly, I, I don't know if it was five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, I, I can't tell you. I, I don't know um, before things started to come back again. And we got through it, uh, captured a few people. Uh, fortunately, nobody was seriously injured on my, my side. Uh, again, I was able, we, were, we, I mean, not just me, but the whole unit, we took care of each other. We, everybody came home. A little, a little worse for wear for some of us, but, uh, but all my guys came back, which was the goal. Accomplish the mission and come back home. And I didn't know I was even hurt until we were done and we were just sitting there and my sergeant major looked over at me and said, hey boss, you're bleeding. I said, what? He said, you're bleeding. And I looked down and by then the adrenaline was gone. I, I just passed out. That was it. I was done. <laughs> were you wounded by small arms? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> yeah, I got nicked. I got like three shots, one right through the side of the kneecap, took that piece off and then two more right below. So it's kind of a rapid fire something. Yeah. That I think, as it was hitting me, it's you know I might have been turning or something. Probably should have jigged instead of zagged right. or something. I don't yeah. know, but yeah. Did you come home after that? Or did it... No, I again. If, um, I'd mentioned I had my own inf my own medical team with a, a medical officer, first lieutenant. Uh, so Dean Williams, so Lieutenant Williams, uh, patched me up uh, with his great corpsman, and um, you know, they gave me a shot and. Told me to take two of these and see me in the morning, and right. and uh, you know you, you just stayed down on the island and then you know until the mission was done, yeah. and then we came home. But like I said, we all came home together. Yeah. How did the troops perform? Oh, you, you had a lot of guys that were Vietnam veterans. But yes. A lot that were not. Yeah, had a lot of new new soldiers. Yeah. Um, in fact, it was interesting. Um, a few years ago, I had to have neck surgery. You know, everything, all the fun times that I was having as a young idiot. You know, it's all catching up with me now as an old wise guy. So um, the doc says, yeah, too many years of flying, crunched over goggles and 
too many jumps, you know, oh, your neck needs to be repaired. So I'm laying there in the hospital at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and this guy standing there, a big burly nurse, <clears throat> told me he had just retired like two weeks before. They offered him to come back as a civilian nurse. He said, so then we started playing that, yeah, I was in the Army, I was in the Army. Well, I was a paratrooper, well, I was a paratrooper, well, I was at Fort Bragg, well, I was at Fort Bragg, well, I was there in the 80s, well, I was there in the 80s, well, I was in the cab, well, I was in the cab. Well, come to find out, he had just finished his basic and advanced individual training, AIT, as a, as a medic, and his first unit was B Troop 17th Cav, my command. I was his first commander, and he went to Grenada with me and helped patch me up. Um, were, were the Gren Grenada, they were getting support primarily from who? Was it from Cuba? Cuba. 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 In fact, um, I still have it somewhere in my memorabilia box. Uh, we found not only cases, uh, boxes that had rice stenciled on it, and it, you open it up and it's full of ammunition. Just small arms, individual, not clips or anything, just dumped small arms rockets, um, rifles, a lot of Chinese and Russian bolt action rifles. I, I can remember coming in one day from a patrol and there were six Russian single bolt rifles sitting on my, my bunk that the guys had captured while they were out, some of the infantry guys. So we were finding all kinds of this stuff. Uh, the most interesting that I found that I have in my memorabilia box was a t-shirt. And on it it said, some basically welcome to Grenada comrades and there must have been a thousand of these t-shirts that were made that we found and the rumor is that there had been a Russian ship coming towards Grenada with some Russian soldiers on it to relieve the Cubans and to augment the PRAs. Now, I don't know if that's true, that may be, may not be true. Um, so I'm not, so for all the listeners out there, you know, don't send me hate mail or tell me whatever, because again, I'm just telling you what was told to me four years ago. But I can tell you that we had the shirts, because I've got one at home yeah. that, we, that we got, that's going to be these welcomes for comrades that were coming to the island, and it's going to be welcomed by some of the locals. So. <clears throat> Interesting. Lessons learned for you from your time in Grenada? Oh, uh, training, 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 training. Like I said, it could not have happened at a better time for our unit. We were literally at our peak of proficiency, both soldier skills, weapon skills, aerial gunnery with the aircraft, with the Cobras. Um, I mean, we, it's kind of like you go right from the range, right into a combat situation, and you know, communications, the SOPs were great. Lessons learned from the division that I think has played well into subsequent operations since then was there was no joint effort, um, absolutely. Couldn't talk to the other services. Uh, we were told when we needed fuel because there was no fuel set up, we just went in. So we're basically living off of the few um, lips that I've got of gas, but we needed to fly out to the Navy ship, the Guam which was an amphibious assault ship that they had floating out in St. George Bay, which is on the other side of the island from where we were. They were on the west side. They said, go out there, land, they'll get you gas, and you go back. <clears throat> so we all, all my unit had to be carrier qualified with the Navy. So we had to learn how to land on carriers and deck landings and stuff like that, which we were. So we're flying out, <laughs> out there one day, and we'd, we'd been in a firefight, and look down and see the gas. We used to, much like what the Air Force does, you know, call bingo and, you know, you take off, go get gas, and here comes the next guy's coming in. So Bill Fowl, Chief Warrant Officer 3, Bill Fowl, he's my wing guy, Vietnam veteran, pilot during the war. So we're flying along, we're headed out, and I'm calling, hey you, this is me, here we come, ready or not, we need gas. And this guy on this Navy ship says, uh, Viper, are you, are you uh, carrier qualified? We went, yeah, I mean, we're still flying. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You could hear almost like he's flipping through pages. It's like, well, I don't see your name on the flight log or anything like that. And well, you know, we have to think about this before we let you get on the on board plane. I mean, my gas gauge is getting down to fumes. 
and about, I don't know, a few bits of this back and forth of the aircraft, I look over and Bill has got his Cobra turned up like this and he is screaming past me towards the Guam. I'm going, where in the world are you going? So he flies right into the conning tower, pulls it up to a quick stop, lowers the nose down, swivels the 20 millimeter right at the, the tower and says, well, my boss says we're going to land, we're going to land. And about this time I hear this, uh, flight, you're clear to land, winds and whatever. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, my career is over. I might as well just you know, take it off right here. But we land and then here come the Navy guys with the hose and guess what? Undo the cap, doesn't fit. Wow. Can't get the gas into the, the aircraft. So we have to shut down the aircraft. They have to go find an adapter, stick it on. Now we can get gas which means now I've got to restart the aircraft and all this is time and there's stuff going on that we need to be back there and not sitting on an aircraft carrier. So that was frustrating. Uh, again, comms was an issue. Um, when we landed in, in Barbados, we undo all the stuff for the aircraft to start putting our aircraft, our helicopters together, you know, getting the blades put back on and stuff like that. And now, they bring out the ammunition pallets. Now we're a CAV unit, so we don't really worry about tow missiles. That's not our job to be knocking out stuff. Our job is to scout and put down suppressive fire and then bring everybody else in to take over from them. We go back to the ostrich club kind of deal, right? So we open up the, uh, the ammunition pallets. There's not a single 20, miller, 20 mil millimeter round in any of the ammo pallets that the division gave us. It's all tow missiles and stuff. So they got it backwards. And I'm thinking, I can't go in and attack with no guns. You know, that's what we do. I can't send my Cobras in. Well, it just so happened that the Air Force had their Spectre gunships there at Barbados Airfield. Guess what they use? 20 millimeter Gatlin, same exact bullets and casings that we use. So I went over and I saw the Colonel that was the commander and I told him what the deal was. And he said, how many do you need? I said, well, there's 750 rounds of basic load, and I've got 12 Cobras over there. So he told us, looked at his warrant officer and said, go take care of the boys. And we still have kept up over these years, too, before he passed away a year ago, But um, the colonel. But yeah, I mean, so that's how we ended up getting that. Again, and then I think the, the worst, but it was a learning experience, is, and, and those of you that are listening to this, um, we, we train and we talk about standard operating procedures. I mean, from the time you join the military, all branches until you graduate, SOP, SOP, this is how we do it. We do it to standards, we train to standards. This is the methodology, standards, standards, standards. When we got into Grenada, it's kind of like all that just went right out the window. A lot of the things in the initial couple of weeks that were going on that the division was leading was being done by personalities, not by standard operating procedures. And by that, I mean, if this colonel commanding his unit was louder than this one, he got the operations officer to let him do what he wanted to do instead of that. And I'll give you a classic example. If you look up the Calvigny barracks operations where the Rangers were killed uh, by friendly fire, we lost, what, three Blackhawks from the aviation battalion because they crashed into each other in the landing. If you go and look, what you'll notice is not there is the Air Cav Squadron initial assault to prep the, the area, which is exactly how we train. We go in, we scout it out, we know exactly where everything is, we let people know, we prep it, get out of the way, and let the assault come in. They decided they didn't need us. They just flew in blind, and when they did, they came off the water, they came up to the top. Suddenly they realized they're not at the target, they're in the middle of the target area. And they're getting incoming fire from almost 270. And they started you know, flaring Blackhawks and crashed into each other. The Rangers are hopping out, the door gunners are trying to shoot the bad guys on the side, the Rangers are running in front of them. I mean, it was just, it was a mess. And it was all because we didn't do what we had trained forever to do. Just blew it out because, nope, we don't, 
I know we, that's how we train, but no, we're, we're going to take the limelight here. And we're we're going to take the credit. We're going to do it our way. And it costs. It costs people their lives. Any humorous moments that stand out from your time in Grenada? <laughs> oh, uh, well, there was a couple of things. Uh, as corny as we might be at times, um, because at one point, you know, we're trying to consolidate our efforts. So we're me, my sergeant major, my operations officer, my operations NCO, and a couple of my captains were all in the same kind of tinnage area, you know, for sleeping purposes. <clears throat> and if those who remember back then, there was a show going on called the Waltons, you know, from Walton, Walton Man Mountain. And every time the show ended, everybody, the family's going to bed, and all the kids are going, good night, John Boy, good night, Mary Lou, good night, Elizabeth, good night, Dad, good night, Mom, good night, Grandma, all that kind of stuff. We started doing that. So it was like, good night, Captain Bendix, good night, Captain Skaggs, good night, Top, good night, Boss. And then <laughs> we'd all end up in good night to NBC News. And the reason was is because NBC had a helicopter there on the island. I don't know how they did it, but they had one of these little loaches and they wanted to interview us. They wanted to be in, in our operation. They wanted to televise it. I kept saying, no, you guys, y'all need to go away. You're gonna, in fact, one of them tried to fly his helicopter right in the middle of our, our base. And one of my warrant officers said the next time he did it, he's gonna shoot him out of the sky. So he finally left. But because they just kept after us, it just kind of got to be a corny joke, only amongst us. Nobody else is probably thinking it's funny, but we go through this John Boy thing and then all of us at the same time at the end of it, and good night to NBC News. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, we had those kind of incidences. Um, another one, real quickly, as you take off from Pearl's airfield, <clears throat> the airfield literally runs out into the ocean, due east, you know, zero nine zero, going that way. And not too far out was this rock formation that just kind of stuck out, you know, like your thumb, just some rocks. So when you take off, you want to do a weapons check. So you'd go arm and you'd fire just a few rounds from the gun and one rocket, just to make sure that the rocket management system worked, the guns worked, and then you'd break off and then you'd carry on with your patrol. You know, everybody would take off and head that way. So one day, we're, and the water level changed. You know, the ocean's coming in and out. So you'd see a little bit of the rock or you'd see a lot of bit of the rock. It would just depend upon when you were flying. So one day, <clears throat> we're taking off, and uh, one of my warrant officers, he's up front. You know, so he says, well, I'll, I'll go first. So he goes, all right, go and arm, guns, rocket. And it, he hits the rocks. I mean, it's like, boom, you know, everything hits. And about the time I start to roll up like this on mine, my aircraft, I see a fisherman in a boat on the backside of those rocks, and he is just paddling like crazy. <laughs> We had no idea who was back there. Why he was back there, I don't know. But we saw this little guy. So we almost killed a civilian in a boat that we had no idea was back there. Yeah, that was his fishing hole. That was his fishing hole. I don't think he fished anymore until we, <laughs> until we left. Right. right. What, what becomes of your career after Grenada? Um, well, uh, again, had a great time, great tour, another two, two years or so in the 82nd. Um, had a second command in the 82nd, and I was also uh, the division operations, deputy operations officer. Because one of the battalion commanders that I had supported, George Crocker, became the G3, the operations officer. And he lived up the street from where I was. And he told me one Saturday that I was being moved from the cab and ended up working with him for the about nine, that last nine months I was in the division. Uh, fantastic. Love working with him. He ended up retiring as lieutenant general. I saw him again years later at it. Fort Lewis when he was the I Corps commander. Um, so anyway, so I did that. Uh, then I got selected for the British exchange tour. So I came up. Uh, my assignments guy said, hey, it's, it's time that you stop having so much fun down there and you know you got to go back to the to the real army again. But you want to go to Germany, back to Germany, and because I'd already been there, loved it. He said, you'd like to go back to Germany? You'd also mention England. He said, how about if you do both? I said, well, that's great. He said, yeah, but you have to interview. So you have to come up to the Pentagon and interview for the job. I said, okay. So I drive up to the Pentagon. I walk in. I meet this colonel. And he says, here, read this. 
gave me a couple of notebooks. I'll come get you. So again, I'm a captain, seen, very senior, soon to be major, and he disappears, comes back, and he says, okay, the general will now see you. I said, oh, that's who I'm interviewing with, some general, okay. So I walk down and I go into the, to the uh, deputy chief staff for operations, the desk ops, for the whole army. He's like the G3 for the whole army sitting there in the Pentagon. And I walk in and I knock on the door and I hear this enter. So I walked in, saluted, reported as required. And uh, he looks up, returns my salute, says, Gordon, good to see you again. Have a seat, I'll be right with you. And I'm like, this three star knows who I am? by Because I go by my middle name. So unless you know me, most people just say, Louis G or hey Louis, you know, something like that. Then I know they don't know me. But he did. He looked right at me and says, Gordon, good to see you again. Have a seat. So I'm sitting there going, like, why does this guy know me? I'm like, Rolodex and well, come to find out, back on Grenada, um, I had a visit after it was in December time frame. Admiral Metcalf, who was the three star vice admiral that was running the operation under uh, joint command that um, he came to visit my operations. So I was you know, kind of honored to have the Admiral, but well, when he showed up, he ends up with the 18th Airborne Corps Commander, Jack McMull, Lieutenant General McMull, who I find out he and my Sergeant Major were buddies in Vietnam when he was a company commander and Paul was a squad leader with them. So they go off and disappear, first name basis, buddy, buddy. So he has, the Admiral has these two one-star generals beginning generals with them, a Marine guy and an Army guy. And I really didn't pay much attention to them because I'm focused on the Admiral. So we get done with the briefing, the Admiral drifts off, the two generals are standing there talking, I'm kind of talking to them a little bit. <clears throat> so back into the Pentagon, three years later, here I am talking to this three star. And he says, so how's it been since Grenada? You're looking good. And I was like, I'll be damned. You were the Army one star that visited my operations office. He said, yeah. So, and the guy was Norman Schwarzkopf. Wow. So General Schwarzkopf became my new boss on the exchange side. And uh, he says, and I mean, literally the interview, he says, so you're looking good. He said, time for an assignment. And I said, yes, sir. And he says, you want this job? And I said, yes, sir. And he says, sure. So, I mean, that was the interview. It wasn't, here's what it is. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what we need you to do. Nope, none of that. It was, you want the job? You got it. So I became the only Army aviator assigned to the British Army Air Corps tactical unit. That was it. I was a token American. <laughs> and it worked out well, because again, uh, coincidence, whatever, one General Schwarzkopf was there who remembered me. I get over there, um, I get promoted, I'm mismatched now. And I talked to David Cranston, who was the regimental colonel, told him what the situation was. I said, I, don't, I just got here, I don't want to leave. But how about if I become your operations officer at the regiment? I'm not going to turn into an American aviation unit, but I'll take care of all your tactics, uh, standardize your helicopter training programs, I'll do your war plans, you know, we'll do all that stuff. And he liked the idea, because he was one of these Scott's guys, he wanted to play Army and do all this. So he said, sure. So I became the first regimental operations officer in the British Army Air Corps, which now every regiment in the Army Air Corps has an operations section. So I did that. Did that for a while and then um, came up with 659 Squadron. That commander was rolling out, new guy was coming in, and the new British guy was injured, severely injured in a motorcycle accident. So unbeknownst to me, Colonel Cranston calls General Sir Martin Farndale and asks Sir Martin uh, about this idea he had. And Sir Martin said, yeah, it sounds good. Let me get a hold of General Schwarzkopf. And General Schwarzkopf allegedly says, I don't care. You got him. You do whatever you want to with him. Uh, so on a Friday afternoon, I got called over to the regimental office and was told that Monday morning I was out of, to be out of my operations office and I was taking over as commander of uh, 659 Squadron. Four regiment. So I became the first American to ever command a British attack helicopter squadron. Cool. It was cool. Yeah. It was very cool. Yeah. So 
<clears throat> what does the Army hope to accomplish by that, by sending you over there? What was the... Well, we had an exchange program that's very, it's a very large program within the Department of, of the Army. Well, I think all the military services do it, actually. And, um, and so you have an opportunity to serve with our allies. You learn about them so you can bring that knowledge back. Um, maybe something that they do well that we don't do or something that we can augment our training and standards on. So a lot of that. And then, of course, what we bring is the same thing. So, for example, I became an instructor pilot. As a commander, the, the Brits have commanders that can do instructor pilot because you want to be able to write firsthand the reports on your aviation crews. So I would go out and actually do maneuvers with my pilots in the aircraft. I do, I demonstrate, they do it back and forth. And one of the, there was a few things that the Brits did that were different, but once I showed them how we do it, um, it's like, oh, that's, that's, that's kind of cool. That's more efficient maybe, and maybe we could change or at least revise our tactics. Again, they were not gonna become American pilots, right. but it's kind of like, well, why do you do this? How about if you looked at doing the maneuver this way and here's why, and they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So, you know, I used to tell my guys when we do running landings, which is where you're bringing the aircraft in, but you don't have enough power to bring it to a hover, so you have to land it like a like a heli like an airplane, right. but you do it on the side. The Brits would come in at about a 300 foot a minute rate of descent, and then they'd get about five feet off the ground, and then they'd just lower the collective and go like, boom, you know, and set it down like that. So I said, you don't need to do that. Just keep it going and just slide it right. I mean, it'll just be smooth. Yeah. So when I take them out, it's all right. So we're gonna do some running landings. The object of the exercise today is don't bruise the grass, okay? So don't be planting. We're not gonna yeah. be planting potatoes out here by the runway, so just, so that's how they learn how to do that. Yeah. What year did you retire? 98. What rank were you? Colonel. Colonel. Okay. Uh, looking back on your career, especially your time in combat, how, how do you think that has affected or shaped who you are today? Well, it makes you appreciate life. Yeah. Yep, you do that. Um, friends, like I said, a lot of the people I met during my military career, uh, we still keep in touch. Even a lot of my British guys. Uh, we're still on Facebook or emails. Um, we still keep in contact. I had a chance to meet some people that are members of the House of Lords, House of Parliament. Um, you know, we still keep in touch today. And, you know, not often, but it, at least I can, I can send a note or they'll send me a note and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's just the friendships and the memories. Uh, again, stuff I couldn't make up. Yeah. You got, uh, this is the last question for you. You've got somebody um, who might watch this interview 50 or 100 years down the road. What message would you, what advice would you send them, uh, especially somebody who's considering a career in the military? Uh, there's no great honor. Um, I think we need more of it. I've, I've been concerned for years that America has divorced itself from the military. Um, that nowadays we have so many of our youth who even if they wanted to serve, they can't because they don't qualify because of some reason, be it physical or mental, uh, overweight. They don't have the education. They don't, they've got uh, personal issues. They've got drug issues. I mean, if you think about less than, right around 2%, you know, 20% of our youth, even if they wanted to serve, that's, that's the ditch right there. All the other 80, they, they don't even qualify. We have to get them up to another standard to get them in. And the fact that we well, have so few people that even do serve that the connection between the military and the local communities, where we used to have guard and reserve centers in most cities, I mean, they're all gone. So you don't even have that with our country. And that, that sense of void between the, the military and the country, I think is just being compounded and compounded. So when we do have a requirement, you don't have the backing of the, of the American public like we used to. Right. And so I would say, if anything, we need to do it. I personally, I'm not for a draft as such like we used to. What I am for is a sense of dedicated service that every American citizen must do. Two years, don't care how you do it, but you need to do something to give back to the freedom that you've been given. Peace Corps, volunteer service, 
go as an exchange person somewhere to another country, learn something, get the hell out of here, go to a country and appreciate what you don't have when you're in certain parts of the world versus what you have here. Go learn that and then bring that back. If you wanna serve in the military, great. Do that too, but go do something. Go learn something, get the hell out of here and, and go broaden your perspectives, learn what's out there from others, learn different cultures, languages, food, you know, something simple like that. Get out of fried chicken, go try something else. You might like it. And then bring all that back and I guarantee it'll make our country better. That's really good advice, so I, I totally agree with that. What we're significantly lacking in that in service and things like that. So that's that's really good advice. So I hope he, who, whoever's watching this, listening to this, will, will heed that advice. So, so well, on behalf of the Americans of Wartime Experience, sir, thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. For taking the time to sit down and tell your story. Uh, more importantly, and I know this sounds cliche sometimes, but it's heartfelt. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, Cause as you just described, service is extremely important. No, thank you. Thank I'd you. do it all over again. I really would. Yeah. yeah well, it was you. fun. Yeah. I'm just crazy enough to do it all over again. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.